some context, uh, this is a very high level presentation. I can talk about Kubernetes for hours, um, but this is more to understand the reasons behind uh, why people have worked on Kubernetes, um, why it can work for you, and kind of give you some motivation to, to learn about it. Um, uh, Kubernetes started back in Google um, when they have thousands and thousands of containers and they wanted to uh, a platform that can easily manage containers. Um, they created something called Borg and that transformed in something called Bosch. And now it's uh, the name they have. They have different names during the time, but now it's called Kubernetes. It was open source uh, or donated to CNCF, which is a cloud native foundation. Um, has a platform for managing uh, containers. That's the background story of why Kubernetes is Kubernetes. Um, the spelling of the name, I think it's depending of what you like. Some people call it in different ways. Uh, but let's start by, um, I can't scroll, okay. Uh, why, why Kubernetes um, is a product that so many people have used and have grown since 2014 into a point where uh, thousands and thousands of people were on KubeConf last year on San Diego. And the main, one of the main reasons is we have seen a grow of the use of containers and workloads has a primary option of deployment uh, since Docker was around, like since C containers was around, right? Um, so I'm gonna give, uh, I don't know how much you know about containers, um, but let's, Let's see, uh, a container is just um, a group of namespaces in Linux um, that can accommodate um, processes in the system. Um, if we click uh, the Linux namespaces, it goes to the main page. Um, what you can see, there are multiple uh, namespaces you create to isolate processes in a given system in Unix. Um, we have the UTS, uh, which is the host name. Uh, you have the user namespace uh, for group IDs, users, and whatnot. Um, you have the time, the PID, which is the process ID, uh, mount, which give you uh, the storage, uh, the network namespace, which is very important, which is the way that you connect and to, um, to the world. Um, you have the IPC, um, and the C groups that are more um, also like for system uh, resources. Um, so running on Kubernetes, running containers um, in production is very hard for many reasons. I think it's very easy to create containers in the wrong way, have diff difficult security issues um, one main issue that many people have experienced is that it's easy to get root access to a container if you don't have the right security policies in your software. So this is another layer that developers nowadays have to figure out in order to deploy their applications, um, sorry about that, um, in, in production. Uh, so Kubernetes have idealized that you can focus on running your process and your application. Let's say it's an API, let's say it's a web application, and you deploy this in the form of a pod. Uh, a pod is a group of shared namespaces, especially the networking namespace and the process namespace uh, into um, a container where all their containers live in, within it. Um, the main reason of this is that you can only focus on your application and the other people that focus on like security or networking or something else can attach containers to that pod 
um, and and help you out building your application. Let's say you have a your DevOps team or your SRE. Uh, you don't have to explain every developer how login should work. Um, as long as you, you go to standard out, standard error, uh, you can deploy another container in this spot that aggregates that data and send it somewhere else. So your, uh, your developers do not need to understand how logging works inside the system. Uh, if you click uh, what a pod is, um, I mean, I'm not gonna read any of this information, uh, but uh, what, what the image is trying to say here is that you have your web server, which is like you happy developer is running and, and you can have multiple or only one uh, container into this mode that is easy to, uh, to manipulate and secure. Like one example is that in the development that we use, we're trying to go as simple as the only thing that is possible in that container is my application to be running. Uh, I put a binary of my application and I run it and I don't have root access, I don't have anything else. And if I want to debug, I create a container for debugging that has all the tooling for networking and other debugging tools and I attach that to the pod so I can SSH into it and watch what's happening in the pod. So it's very secure and it's very flexible in the way that you want to do stuff. Um, and that's basically how Kubernetes have seen the workloads and how to manipulate uh, containers in it. The second reason of why Kubernetes is there as a mainstream is that uh, nowadays infrastructure uh, for distributed systems is very hard to, to manage. Um, it's very hard to know where is what and uh, coordinating with the whole company you're working on to make sure that uh, the networking is in place to communicate with each other. Uh, the high availability is there to don't let um, part of your organization being down for, for, for a period of time, depending on uh, how your software work. Um, and, and that the group of people who are responsible for the infrastructure um, they often are a small group um, in, in comparison with the organization. What ends happening in big organizations is that they become the bottleneck of what's happening in deployments. So every time that you wanna deploy something, you have to put a ticket, you have to put a, a request, you have to make any email or information to this small group that is bombarded by the whole organization to make changes on the infrastructure. Uh, Kubernetes help you. Oh, you want me to zoom in for sure. Sorry about that. Uh, let me just do this. Um, is that better? I can do more. Um, yeah. And so Kubernetes have created a way that they know how to automate uh, the requirements of the business, secure the requirements, deployment requirements, uh, SLOs and SLA into what they call the Kubernetes controllers. So in this, in this cluster of machines and containers, some of the machines and some of the containers are responsible to make sure that the other containers are in a good state. Uh, we'll, we'll dive into that in, in, in a little bit in the future, but so far as it's, you can see as a, um, as a controller that controls other containers and manipulate them depending on uh, some policies that you put in place. And it's very modular. Um, what I mean by that is that every API that is built on top of Kubernetes and in, internally into Kubernetes, it depends on something smaller of the same size. Um, we can go through some examples in the, in, in the principles of Kubernetes, uh, but this infrastructure that is so modular with the automated part of the controllers, it's, uh, it's uh, one of the key factors why this is so well adopted um, 
in the community nowadays. And the other is when you want to deploy an update, something, sometimes you don't know if your update is going to crash. You don't know if your update is uh, like what is the process of deployment? Maybe your company wants to roll out some of the process, some of the, the like versions you have, and it's it's very hard nowadays to when you have the system where everything is through ticket to roll things out and make sure that everything um, is up to date with the right version. So one of the things that Kubernetes have in place is one is very scalable uh, with the the introduction of controllers, you can say the minimum amount of up instances for my payment API is five, and there is going to be at least five containers running your uh, your 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 payment um, API. Um, everything that happens inside the cluster is very visible by anything on the cluster. So if everything fails, if everything is not running correctly, it's very easy to know this. So it's easier to debug as a DevOps engineer. Uh, one one thing that is that I can I I cannot count how many times I have a call with a customer where we don't know what's going on inside the, their their applications. Like I have to go and why shard the network, I have to SSH to every every VM to understand what's happening. Um, and Kubernetes have made really easy to make it visible to you, uh, the administrator of the cluster, um, what's happening uh, with events and, and login mechanism. Uh, um, the time saving, uh, I will say like it's it's very easy to stop something, to roll back something. It's very easy to uh, understand what version and what uh, specifically image Shaw is running in what container at what time and how many users are using it. Uh, and version control, I think, is the same. It's very easy through, uh, I, I think it's more like containers based, but like uh, the way you update is by creating a new image of your container. So it's very easy to track uh, what happens in every version, any image on this. Uh, this is an overall of um, why Kubernetes is so popular nowadays and was getting a lot of traction um, on on the community. And and one of the reasons keeping doing this for six years now um, is due to, I think there's a lot of principles in Kubernetes, but I think these three are the most important ones that you can learn. Uh, one is the declarative API. Uh, one, I think there is a there is a difference between telling a system what to do and telling a system what you want things to be. Um, one is declarative, uh, which is a, I want this to be like this, right? Like the imperative is I want to create a container, right? And the declarative way to say that is I have this container that I want to be running, right? you declare the end state of the process and the other is you uh, imperatively say or write commands to do X, Y, and Z, create, delete, update, whatnot. But it's very hard for small teams in, in the DevOps to understand when and how to create all the things. Uh, so it's, it, and it's easier for developer to understand what needs to ha happen or what needs to be the end state to your application to be running successfully? Like, I want a database. I want uh, this network's namespace uh, active on me. I need root access to my initial container. I don't know. There are many things that you can specify in the API that can let you uh, declare how your application is going to be running, which is one of the more powerful things that Kubernetes has. Um, the other one is the APA transparency in the system. Everything is a storage in, I will zoom out even more because it's an image, um, in this XCD um, database. XCD is a, a key value storage database that Kubernetes uses to store everything that is the state of the art for your cluster. 
sorry about that. Um, and every everybody or every container that had access to this, I will say the call from the the control plane, uh, can see and retrieve information from the XED to understand what is the current state. Uh, there is no secret agenda. There is no secret thing. So for security, this is very important because it's very easy to see when things go wrong, uh, seeing that you can uh, attach things to uh, what the system and state should look like. And the other is that it's, it's very extensible. Um, and one thing is that these XCD um, objects that you store, uh, there is a by default, there is a lot of them, um, but you can create custom ones. And I personally create a lot of them uh, since I deploy things that extend the Kubernetes cluster for you. Um, and I read and update status on those objects. So you can very easily extend how your cluster behave depending on the business requirement your company have. Um, and the name for that is uh, custom resources. So custom resources are, um, again, there's a link there, but it is basically like a custom object, uh, I will say a struct that you can create in your API that will uh, be uh, you, your controllers that the thing that connects and those things in the control and the containers can read and say, okay, this person wants me to uh, do this and this and that. Um, and in on okay in in a declarative way, right? That that's the that's the caveat there is that you custom resources and it's a declarative um, API where you say, I want an application that has this service and I have this database and, and whatnot. And one of the patterns that they use to do that is the operator pattern. Uh, that it's a, I think it's a little bit more advanced um, for this talk, but um, is a way that you can write your custom controllers um, in your Kubernetes uh, cluster. So you deploy one of the things that, that is very famous, uh, one of the things that I worked on, is uh, service meshes are custom controllers that manipulate the services and networking events in your system. And one of them is Istio. Um, let's go back to the hack MD. And I wanna give, now that we have only eight minutes, I'm gonna give a, a, like, a huge overview of what are the parts inside a cluster on the Kubernetes. Um, we're talking about that the XED is your main source of truth, where all the resources are going to be storage. Uh, these resources are in the form of YAML. Um, one example, let's, let's see what, uh, let's see, we have concepts here, uh, containers. I will say, let's do a policy because it's easier. Let's see if there's. There's no YAML here. Okay. Give me a YAML. I want a YAML. Okay. So these are basically um, how it looks, a basic object in the XED. When you have the API version of your object, the type of object that you're doing in this time is a job that runs once and stop, um, has some metadata and some spec. The spec will create a template for you. Uh, the template is basically what's going to happen inside that pod. And this, for example, this pod only have one container, which is a busy box that runs this command and sleep. And that's it. Uh, it's a job. It runs once. Of course, this is very basic, but you get the idea of how declarative um, your API might be. Um, so those objects are stored here. Um, you talk using something called kubectl or kube control or kube cuddle, depending on how you name it or where you learn it, um, with this kube API server. You write commands. Um, uh, one example would be, I think I have one here. Uh, if I write kubectl get pods, it will tell me all the pods. I don't have anything, but I can say, give me nodes which is like the nodes that 
will storage or will run your containers on, like virtual machines. In this case, there is only one because it's just a mini cube, which is like a local version, like a Docker Compose or Docker um, engine that you have in your computer. So it's not like something that you get from uh, a cloud provider, right? Um, so you, you talk to this API. This API writes, the only thing that it does is write things to the XCD. That's the only job it does. Say, so get your object, validate that that object is valid, validate that you have the authority and authentication for making this object changes or create, and store that on the XCD. Then every controller will watch every change that you do to the objects in the XCD. And depending on what they are, it will make changes to your containers. So for example, if you want to create a pod that runs a Hello World app, you say, I want to create a pod. Um, this is the, my declarative say, please do it. And the cube controller manager uh, will say, OK, this person say that this, there is an object in status pending in the XED for a pod. And it creates a pod object with, with no name in this case, because there is no identifiable container or pod running in your containers. And then one of the last controllers that runs in specifically into a pod is a scheduler. And the scheduler uh, will talk to every VM inside your cluster and, be, and choose one, choose the best option for your pod and send a command for like, this person needs to run this container. When that's running, it say it save the data to the uh, XCD and say that object was created, and every change that, you, that happens to that pod, it will be reflected into the XCD. And the the way that it does that is that each VMs or each node on the Kubernetes cluster has an object called Kubelet. The Kubelet will it's it's like a like a gossip uh, process that will tell the API server, every changes that happens in your in your in your VM or your node in this case, right? So if a pod crashes for any reason, maybe uh, it got too many requests and it crashed because X, Y, and Z, it will tell the API server that that pod crashed. The XED will say this pod is crashed, and the the control manager says, okay, but the declarative API say that at least this pod, one of this pod needs to be running. And he has scheduled another pod where the cube scheduler will run and manage to create a, a different pod to, um, to run your pod in that sense. Uh, through this, um, the all crash one, it just get deleted. So, uh, I think there, there are ways that are hard for Kubernetes when you attach state to your application or something like that that are very hard to handle. But like I think that's a different topic of um, when not to use Kubernetes. And the other important uh, controller is the Cloud Controller Manager. Too often, don't have on-prem machines. I have Raspberry Pis with uh, Kubernetes cluster in my home, but there, there's often a VM in GCP, AWS, Azure, you name it. Um, and this Cloud Controller Manager will ask requests to this um, cloud. Like one of them, for example, is give me a public IP I can use. Uh, so it's attached to one of your containers so you can reach it from outside the world. Um, That's one of the last steps that a deployment or a service can do. Um, this is a really high level. I'm, I know I'm getting short on time, so I want to like continue a little bit. Um, but feel free to ask any questions at any point. Uh, so where can you learn more about this? Um, Kubernetes has a lot of tutorials. Uh, one, this one that I have is open is one of them, which is is creates a simple job in your cluster. Uh, there is a code, code cloud that has another tutorial and other classes. 
Udemy CDA, CKA is a class to prepare you for the certificate for being an administrator. It's very heavy, but if you really, really want to learn Kubernetes, I think there's a way. Um, it's a good way. There is learning Kubernetes in the hard way is, again, it's hard, uh, but you will understand so many things that happens behind the scenes uh, doing it in that way. I didn't put the link here, but I'm happy to, uh, you just have to Google Kubernetes in the hard way. Um, and I have here some reference links. Uh, CMCF, which is um, one of the things I've been working for four years now, is um, the Cloud Native Computer Foundation. And one of the projects we have here in the graduated projects is Kubernetes. Um, and yeah, there is the documentation is amazing. I think uh, the people who write docs and tutorials for this tool are genius and they have really good um, documentation into uh, how to um, run and why to run Kubernetes. Um, and that's pretty much it. I think this is uh, my half an hour. <laughs>